right. The Jews saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? You muted. I'm muted, yes. There Hello, and welcome to the Jew Function Live. I'm happy to be here with my good friend Seth. Chaim. Chaim. Uh, and we are stepping up our efforts I, we, we we made a decision that we want to we want to try to solve this thing by the end of this year because i don't know if we can take another year like 2023 so let's you know as we gear up toward passover and we're starting to think about coming out of slavery let's let's figure out what are we slaves to maybe it's the rampant egoism that's been driving us against each other and and making us you know serve all kinds of selfish interests Maybe we're just, just throwing it out there, uh, but maybe it's time to ask those questions. Like a lot of our guests have been saying here, time to ask some radical questions and time to also take some advice, maybe from historic patterns, from Jewish sages, from uh, even big data and network science, uh, and really from a lot of the guests that were here. You know, if you're not familiar, please check out our channel. Uh, it, you know, you can see it here. You can listen to it on on, uh, on um, Spotify or uh, uh, Apple Podcasts. Uh, you can see short clips on YouTube Shorts or on Instagram. Uh, you can have a conversation on Facebook. Anywhere works as long as you're thinking about those things, as you wanna, as you wanna talk about those things, as you're ready to uncover some, you know, different answers to to those big questions. Let, let's uh, uh, frame it like this, <clears throat> in the simplest terms possible. Imagine you're trying to get a round peg into a square hole, for example, right? So if the, uh, the, the premise, in short, if these people, these Jewish people, can, with this whole Israel situation and, and all of the different forces around it, they can figure out a way to arrange themselves, connect themselves to make uh, the correct size hole, in that example, like for the, for the peg, then this upper light than this light into the nations and whatever this magical thing that has accompanied the Jewish people uh, through all of the empires and this promise, this uh, prophetic promise of this world where uh, the wolf will lie with the lamb and nation won't lift sword against nation. The, the, the simplest way to put this premise is just to make this place to arrange ourselves so that pay, that, that, uh, you know, peg can fit in the hole correctly and everything can line up. This is the, the, uh, this is our goal here to, to, to speak to people from all over the spectrum of all over the Jewish spectrum or around that Jewish spectrum and understand how can we arrange ourselves correctly uh, together in a good way so that this supernatural force so whatever it is this thing that sustains the jewish people this thing that uh, comes and influences the world can can bring goodness for everyone and i'll tell you why um uh why i'm, I'm just a little concerned uh today because the past week i think week week and a half uh i've seen israel getting more and more isolated uh and uh I, again i'm 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 not separating the you know the israeli nation and its politics and its policies and all of that from the no it's one thing for me it's a place where jews call home you can call it whatever you want there's no other place there's no alternative there's no you know so it's the place where jews like to congregate okay that, that's what it is we need such a we need a place like that and uh that place has been under uh attack uh also from forces that you would not normally associate with such such attacks the u.s i think for the first time ever has not vetoed a security council decision uh, a vote on uh, uh on on israel uh usually it's stood by israel's side and yes i know there's the 10 percent of the politics that you see on the outside and then 90 percent behind the scenes but i don't like it i don't like the pressure on the government i don't like the this kind of uh uh, maneuvering that's happening. I don't like these, uh, this, you know, cover, 
uh, magazine covers saying Israel alone. Uh, I don't like the, that uh, uh, voices within Israel are saying that. Uh, I, I don't like it. And I think that uh, it's the fact that it's happening is just more testament of this these inner splits, right? It's like, because when we're together, then we really don't feel alone because we're not alone. There's something else happening when we're together. But when we're starting to split up, to crack, that's when you feel this uh, loneliness creeping up, This these other forces that are just um, threatening to, to really squash this thing, which is really a miracle in the desert, if you think about it. Uh, so... So that's the climate, um, and I, you know, there's a lot happening also that with the media is not showing us, uh, right? It's, Israel is surrounded by all kinds of different interests, and, um, and there are forces working around us here in the Middle East, but also in the U.S., I imagine, and other places. I imagine just like Seth and I are sitting here having our conversation, there are other Seth and Leo from other nationalities talking about the fate of Israel and the Jews and, and all the rest of it, but from a different point of view, different perspective. Uh, so to try to put some order into this, we, we brought uh, a guest, a slightly different guest. I don't think we've had someone quite, quite with quite this, um, this type of experience. Uh, he's, um, he's, uh, you know, he's a, first of all, he's from Minnesota, right? He's from the same district as Ilhan Omar. Another wait 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 Matt, wait a second what? I didn't call you in oh my god <laughs> uh, well you know those strategic people they're not you know entertainment is a foreign thing to them so <laughs> you know uh, so he's from Minnesota he's a senior fellow at the Gold Institute for International Strategy in Washington D.C. and president of Red Axe Strategies with over two decades experience focusing on U.S. foreign policy and national security. Uh, with, with a with a focus on the Middle East, and he's also the head or the, the chair, we'll find out, of um, the counter terror, counter extremism extrem, extremism. Um, uh, I don't know what it is. Is that, is that a? Okay. He'll tell us. He, he'll tell us. He's, he's really he's he's so uh, knowledgeable, and so um, I'm really happy to now call Matthew Brodsky. Oh, it's the American Center for Counter Extremism. So Matt, please join us now. <laughs> Pleasure as, if, to do with you guys. as if it never happened right. uh, how are you man i'm good it's a good sunday out here getting ready for uh spring that's uh as passover reminds us next month nice so tell us like, like as i said most of our guests are not on the strategic you know po you know political side of things um i i wonder tell us a little bit what you're doing what, you know what, and what? What are you focusing on? Like, what's your, uh, where's your, where's your mind at these days? Um, just so people understand where you're coming from. Well, so I've been. I got my master's degree in Middle East history at Tel Aviv University. From there, I moved to Washington D.C. because I wanted to work in a think tank and focus on Middle East policy. Uh, do that type of work. Um, I was really influenced in the very early 2000s by uh, Dennis Ross's book, The Missing Peace. Thought the, the ins and outs of working on the peace process, whether it's the Palestinian-Israeli or the Syrian-Israeli, uh, that all of that was so fascinating. And I wanted to learn about that uh, and work on something like that. So that's what I focused on in D.C., uh, and worked with the Trump administration's peace team, with Jared Kushner's team uh, on the peace process, um, and with the State Department on issues like Iran and uh, and Syria. And basically, when it comes to Washington, once your uh, once your team is no longer in power, the city becomes a lot less fun to be in. Um, so a lot of my friends started moving, and I took an opportunity to come back to Minneapolis, here where I grew up, uh, to work as a political consultant and kind of help Republicans with messaging and making money and all of that fun stuff. So here I am fighting what I consider to be uh, the good fight. That's Leo, can, I, can I jump in, Leo, on something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. This, go ahead. This, this isn't part of the buy or, or Minnesota, but uh, it's something that since I heard you were going to be on, it's been itching uh, because I think this is kind of where the you know, the problem that we're facing is such a huge problem. It's such an eternal problem, right? 
when <clears throat> and the peace process in Israel has been so difficult and so many, you know, there's the, um, what is it, John Kerry, the quote, you know, well, until we get the Palestinians, like we can't. There will never us. be a separate peace until there's a Palestinian-Israeli peace. Right. Never. Here. And he says this at the Brookings Institute just before it, the end of the administration. Exactly. I got a page of quotes to say what you're saying. Okay. So, administration so, officials. so, yes, thank you. So the question kind of is like the whole worldview was like there can never be peace until this thing is solved and then all of a sudden like the dominoes start falling and something changes no whether people agree with it it's just it was they were just business deals they were it doesn't matter people came to the table and yeah you're not going to make utopia in day one but people started at least on an economic level and a and a, an open you know a friendship level started to speak when they didn't before and my big question is like it didn't take a crazy war. It didn't take some like cultural revolution. It just seemed like you just one day you woke up and it started happening. And the question is, how does such a huge change just happen after 50 years of everyone in power saying it can never happen and, 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 and the process failing over and over again? And maybe for people who don't know, maybe you could just give a little bit of background about exactly what I'm talking about. Um, and then say, how does a, a flip like that, how it's like, you know, I, there, I, I was in, the, I was in the third grade class. I never realized, I never, uh, recognized Susie. And then the next day I had a funny feeling in my body and Susie was there. Like all of a sudden the whole world changes, <laughs> right? Like how does the whole right. world just change like, like, like that? So uh, what we had as a, a huge sea change in the way American foreign policy is conducted and how we view the Middle East happened under the Obama administration. And it actually coincided with uh, the really coming to prominence of journalists who absolutely have no idea what they're doing or what they're talking about. And they were operationalized. That sounds like the media. That sounds like the media. <laughs> right. But if you, there was a really in depth interview published in 2015, I think it was Ben Samuels on uh, on the aspiring novelist uh, who's conducting foreign policy or something. But it's basically on Ben Rhodes. He was the, uh, the national security spokesman for uh, Obama, basically with whatever was happening with Israel and for the JCPOA, the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran, in, in which he's basically bragging about, about using this, what, what came to be an echo chamber where they would, they would re, that there were media people who would basically just reprint their press releases. You know, if you gave them a little access, these like recent college grads would explain everything uh, that you want on your behalf. And that, then the administration could also create a third leg of the stool, which is uh, newly minted experts, you know, people from think tanks that you never heard before or whatever. So now you've got this loop of self-validation where, where the administration would lie to you and say, uh, this stops every single path toward Iran's nuclear weapon. When in fact, it closed off no path to the nuclear weapon and in fact legalizes it and puts it at an industrial scale without any limitations at the year 2031. But the administration would say that, the media would quote that, and then the administration would say, go talk to all these think tank people. So you created this entire loop. This deal was really horrible for Israel, obviously, as Netanyahu made clear by coming to Congress in 2015. Um, but it was also catastrophic for our other more moderate Sunni allies in the Middle East, uh, talking Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and all that. Um, the Trump administration completely reversed it. And as we were just talking, it was the idea of John Kerry, but it's a long-standing idea on the left that has not updated itself, uh, that there will be no separate peace with Israel until there's a Palestinian-Israeli peace. The Trump administration, like previous administrations, wanted to extract the United States from the Middle East. He saw a different way of doing that than what Obama did and what Biden is frankly doing again. And what that is, is if the US is going to leave 
or wants to pull back, then why don't we empower our allies? Get them to work together. There have been many attempts to create some kind of Middle Eastern NATO. Uh, they've all failed. But let's get these groups that have uh, the same view of a threat matrix around the region, i.e. Iran, um, and get them on the same page, get them working together so we can have our allies look after their interests and our own interests. Now, that was a totally different view than what Obama and Biden had, which is strategic realignment in order to create strategic balance, which is, I have an idea, let's kick our allies in the shins and empower these people who are our enemies who basically shouted in the streets and painted on their missiles. But if we create this strategic balance, somehow it'll balance out perfectly and no one will go to war or or something. It, it's the, it's an insane view, but that's where that's where we've been. And the, the last thing I'll, I'll say on that to bring it back to you is um we knew. From the beginning, from like 1992 in the Madrid conference, the before Oslo, that the U.S. wanted to make bilateral peace deals between Israel and each state. Bilateral, not comprehensive, because a comprehensive peace deal gives the lowest common denominator uh, a veto, which is always whichever is the most rejectionist state. Instead of learning from what the Trump administration accomplished in the Abram Accords, what the Biden administration now is doing is trying to shoehorn in this deal with Saudi Arabia, Arabia that will not happen under the Biden administration. It will not happen. Um, but in order to elevate the Palestinian issue, which was, again, something on the side of the, of the Abram Accords, like it was something on the side of the Camp David Accords in Egypt. It was all these states deciding, you know what, I'm not going to let the Palestinians who seem to not learn from anything. I'm not gonna let them hijack my country's foreign policy. And here we are again, <laughs> trying to shoehorn them back into the middle of everything and thinking there's going to be a greatly different result. Seth, you want to, I had a question, kind of like a, a, a more a psychological question. I'm, I'm curious, M Matt, I, I mean- I've hundred, so go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> no, I mean, look, we're, we're not, you know, we're not political analysts. We, you know, we don't know all the moves and, and, and all the names, but we are interested in motivations. That That's really important to us. And I'm, I'm curious if you think that there's something, I mean, are, are people, I'll just, just ask this bluntly because I don't care. Uh, are people stupid? Uh, are people evil? Or, or is there, yeah, is there some agenda? Or, that, or is there some other clear. agenda? Exactly. Some other agenda we're not aware of, like, what is going on? Again, by all accounts, you just one visit to the Middle East and you realize, you know, uh, just to, so people know, uh, Israel is the only place in the Middle East where American, uh, America doesn't have any troops that cost them millions of dollars a year to maintain, right, and casualties and all that. It's actually a, a democracy, thriving economy, you know, technology, all, all those great things that we know and appreciate. And dude, I live here. I know it's, it's great. <laughs> it's decent uh, with all the problems. Right. So what's the story? Why is it so difficult to to make this work? As Seth said, is there an agenda? Are people stupid? Are people it's, evil? It's, it's, Are they rooting clear. for the wrong side? Like what's going on? When the, when the parents um, have something to deal with, right, like something's going on with grandma, you, you don't tell the children. You know, you tell the children we're going to give grandma cookies. Let's go to grandma's house and bring, give her a hug and give her cookies. You don't tell them. Right. It's very obvious that politicians treat the world like little children. We don't know really what they're doing. What they put in our in our face is not actually what their agenda is. So we're interested in understanding what are the forces that are actually driving things, not just the headlines. The headlines, we understand it's all lies. So what could be the reason why all of these people are totally sabotaging the Jews? Let's we'll say Israel, well, but we mean the Jews right. for yeah for all these administrations. So there are a number of factors uh, at play, and first of all, yes, there is a lot of stupidity, and yes, there is evil in the world. To be to be quite clear, um, I think what we've seen is a flipping of the elites in American society for the past thirty, forty. 
uh, years. Uh, we've seen the adoption of a progressivism form of, uh, of thinking, a diversity, equity, and inclusion way of thinking, which basically labels Jews uh, and all Israelis, even though it's false, as white. And we're in the oppressor, not the oppressed category. Um, this is how you can justify something, which, as you say, it's Israel is kind of like a mirror of the United States, uh, especially in the region, but just even more broadly across the across the globe. Um, a democratic, thriving society that treats its its you know citizens very well, vibrant. Uh, I mean, whatever. Everyone watching the show here, they know they know this. Yeah. Um, it's a. I think there's. On one hand, geopolitics, which does govern this, and and as I was saying before, to have media coming to where it is today, to have social media where it is today, which is to greatly uh, enhance uh, and multiply the impact of some of the dumbest voices out there, you know, or if if somebody had a really stupid idea. <laughs> And 20 years ago, they were in their basement, and it's like, me and my stupid idea, you know? Now, there's a lot of people really connected with stupid ideas who are like, oh, you think that's stupid? Hold my beer. This one's even more stupid. And then they get together. And have yeah, a... maybe the earth is flat. Oh, right. yeah, sure. <laughs> but I, actually, that's a, that's a great example because so much of what we're seeing now um, is the presentation today of what was old now being new like some of these things like i was talking about the comprehensive comprehensive versus bilateral piece or any way that things are viewed these are old situations that we had litigated as a public as americans broadly as a world it had been like no 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 we all agree pretty much that this is what's right and good, you know? And we're suddenly redoing this. We're, we're suddenly, you know, like communism, yeah, in classrooms. Okay, there are actual failed communist countries within our own hemisphere. You can look at them today. This isn't like, ooh, the Holocaust and poor education, so these people didn't learn about it. It's like, no, it's a country, it's happening today. They are failing and it's horrible. This isn't like, grandpa's telling you some you know old story you know when he used to walk uphill both ways in the snow um this is so how, how can it, so, so how can it be that after all of these years of education and all of these years of progress and all of these years of development that this is happening because the uh internationalization of uh the tikkun olam sort of thinking the repair of the world, but not the rest of the sentence, because, you know, we don't want to leave. put that in there. What's the rest but, of the sentence? Uh, well, I, I, it's basically you're making the world a better place, but for God and for that covenant. It's, it's not just a uh -huh. it's not a call for Jews to like blindly make everything completely better for everyone else, even as you're getting rolled in the process, which is which is what we're doing. Like at some point, Jews should have Jews should say, wait a second, if you go to Israel, it occurs to you that most everyone there isn't all white. Like that's not even the breakdown of how you look at at Israelis, um, which is the number one way of looking at things. Like if you are going to think that there should be an equity in outcome as opposed to an equal opportunity, uh, then this is where you arrive at. This is the natural conclusion. The natural conclusion uh, is to, we're in the middle of like, we should castigate ourselves for what we did to uh, Indians for what for colonial issues, which the United States has never been a colonialist power. You know, we are redefining words that have definitions that you used to be in high school class, and it would be on those multiple choice Scantron things where it would be like, what does this word mean? And there was an absolute definition because you could get it wrong. But we're redefining them for only Jews, genocide, uh, colonialism. Apartheid. Uh, apartheid, right. These are words well, that so, mean so, But things. we're looking, we're, we're looking at... at um... 
you know, changes like, like, like small, small little changes. But if you zoom out and look at the trajectory, because, you know, Gangnam Style, it was the biggest song in the world and nobody cares. Nobody even heard of the guy anymore. Right. right? So yep. all of these kind of things, they're just like little moments. But if you look back at the trend, the trend is, wow, something can hit a billion before it only hit like a, a hundred, you know, then it can hit a thousand. Well, wow, now the trend is that something can go from zero to wow. You know, so when you look at all these things, what is the trend that's happening? Not not each little tick on the on the timeline. The nineteen sixty and in relation to the Jews, like where right. are we going, and what can we learn from this, and what do we need to do now? Like the nineteen sixties radicals, the people who are all free speech, railing against the tightwad Republicans who would like ban books and all of that. That's completely flipped. Those people um, and those kids from that generation are now in charge of our universities. And they know where their coalition is. Their coalition is in the DEI coalition. Um, they know when uh, they come and testify before Congress who the people are that they need to please. You know, And it's not the Jews. It's 100% not us. Um, so we're being taught from cradle to grave now, basically, kids are being taught insane things. Uh, when it comes to history, we're not learning history. Uh, most people don't know American history in America, which is like tough. I, I mean, you should know American history. So they don't even, so obviously they don't know Middle East history, like even more, which allows people to have nice slogans. Now, long before October 7th, all of us knew that it's always easier to be a Palestinian uh, and to talk about what the problem is. You just yell occupation, occupation, occupation. And then we're we're the ones who have to, you know, actually clarify what they're talking about, you know, and, and it takes us many sentences to do that. Um, but it's a fast food society now. And this is this is where where we are. The easiest thing to do is to come out and yell from the river to the sea on the street, you know, without having any clue what river, what sea, what does that even mean? They have no idea. A lot of them have no idea. The others, they do, they justify it. And I mean, for me, you've seen Israel go for many years um, with Hasbara that was trying to sell the finer qualities of uh of israel like hey we got all the beaches and we're great like yeah, yeah, yeah. don't don't get us started on that that was that's a terrible attempt at yeah. this point at this point look I, I they will respect you when you win you're not getting any more normalization agreements with anyone if you fail if Hamas is still in power at the end of this, you will get nothing aside from having lost the war. The rest of the region is like, wow. And if America is too dumb right now to realize that every single other ally in the Middle East specifically, but elsewhere, is looking at how we're treating Israel has whiplash and is saying... They're probably not dumb. It's probably a policy decision. Yeah, well... But that was some of the genius of what the Obama administration did. They explained, and it was brought to the media and the American people as like, this is the way it had always been done. If you look at Trump's policies in the Middle East, not his communications, yeah. granted I'm better having lived in DC at separating out that's communications, that's a three in the morning tweet from the toilet. Yeah. And yeah. here's the actual policy. The policies were normal, mainstream, American, and some of them incredibly smart. Yeah. The idea that the Obama administration had, which was to create a nuclear deal, which was in, in effect a Trojan horse to lock in America's strategic alignment because it did not stop Iran from getting a nuclear deal, and then basically to force the Middle East into this, like, no, we'll all get along, even though everyone knows what Iran's goal is that was incredibly new. I mean, you didn't, I know this from being in think tanks. It used to be the domestic policy was where you would have a think tank for the left and a think tank for the right, and they didn't cross pollinate. But foreign policy, at least for a lot of the 90s and the time before that, just because you had a thought or an idea that worked in foreign policy for the right didn't mean it wouldn't work for the left. But now, 
whatever you do on the left, you can't have on the right. You won't be listened to if you work with the Trump administration. You won't be listened to. We have the Biden administration had to come in to prove to itself how right it was by undoing as much of what Trump did as possible. So, I mean, <laughs> so we went after Saudi Arabia to make the far left base of the party happy because of the Khashoggi, you know, killing of this uh, journalist. Yeah. Uh, I worked for Qatar, basically. Um, but we went after them and attacked them and then decided, wait, we need their oil because we're not drilling enough ourselves because of a different coalition we're trying or, to. Or we need even uh, not their oil, we need Indian gas. So let's put a, a train through in, you know, through Saudi, from India right. through Saudi Arabia and Israel to Europe and, and a pipeline, right? Yeah. yeah so, so so and and now we're trying to court Saudi Arabia, buddies. Hey, I you've always been my favorite. I always loved you. I called you an international pariah. Um, but whoops, you know. <laughs> so you can you can see the sanctions. We within the first uh, week took the Houthis from Yemen off the sanctions list. They seem pretty terroristy to me. I don't know about you. Like, <laughs> seems to me when you're launching missiles. What, what could be the agenda? Where, where is America going if we look beyond the headlines and see what the administration? Be before, before you ask that, can I say just remember that question for the future? I just said because uh, someone is saying stuff on the chat, and I want to, I want to just uh, relate to that. There's, there's all this uh, talk about, oh, you know, the Jews they control stuff, and Israel controls the U.S., not the I, other way around. We're so that good with APAC. Look at the nuclear deal that they sank their entire reputation in and failed. Right. And, and, and no, and I'm surprised. October people... 7th, another brilliant example of us succeeding, controlling the world, right? Exactly right. And, and, I'm, and, and even now, all, the, all these American foreign policies, I don't see where, where exactly is Israel controlling the U.S. I, I, I don't see any of that. So just to answer the, one of the questions from the, from the chat. So, um, yeah, Seth, go on. Go ahead. No, please, please. Okay. No, you want to ask about the future. Like, where is yeah. it? Where is it? Uh... So it does. It doesn't seem to me that these things are happening by accident, or the U.S. is so dumb, or that it seems to me there's a very clear agenda. There's a fundamental belief in in this strategic realignment deal. Like, oh, when Obama, after getting the JCPOA together, he gathered. Sunni Arab leaders at Camp David in the summer. I think it was in June of uh, 2020. Um, and he basically told them, and, and incidentally, some of this stuff is right as far as organization, but this shows you what the thinking was. And this is according to minutes kept by people who were there. So it was actually published in Foreign Policy uh, magazine um, by uh, Michael Hanna. I believe that, no, John Hanna from FDD, who was also on the National Security Council, basically brought the Arab countries together and was like, "The you guys need to be more like the Iranians. Like the IRGC and their proxies are so much better. None of you guys seem to get together, seem to share beliefs, seem to work toward the same purpose. But the Iran, and the Quds Force and all of that, they are way more organized and just a stronger group than, than all of you guys, which would of course come as a rather large slap to all these Arab world leaders. Um, but again, there is some merit in it, but it shows a thinking in the United States that creating a balance or U.S. realignment or in keeping with other DEI philosophies, which are we need to whip ourselves like it's Ashura <laughs> for the you know like of Shias just whip ourselves in pain um in order to get back it, in order to be okay with where we are so we need the, so we need to whip ourselves and the problem with the Iran America relationship is that so, we are the bad people not them so so you, so it, it's interesting so you what you're saying is if i understood correctly is that like this this uh somewhat crazy woke or progressive ideology is now infiltrated the foreign policy as well and where the bully is not a, the bad guy we have to include them embrace them they have to hear like how many times have we heard since october 7th on rape name the disgusting issue oh i really we need to put this in context for me Paul is the head of the uh 
the spokesperson for the um, Progressive Caucus in, in the House, the vice, the deputy one is Elon Omar, who's in my district. But um, she asked directly by Dana Vash of CNN about, about the rape. We have to contextualize this. Who right. the hell has ever had to contextualize rape? What is the okay situation for raping someone? So Matt, what does this mean for the what Jews? Is what is what, what is going? What let's is let's this? be let's be sober. Let's be real and let's be clear and like let's not mince words here. What is the outlook for the Jews in in this kind of climate? Um, the outlook for Jews is fantastic inside of Israel because at the end of this, they will destroy Hamas. They will create a new level of deterrence. They will have learned. Uh, what they they will have learned the way they need to stand up uh i knew studying and putting out monographs from think tank the nerdy stuff of policy back during the syrian civil war i was really looking at the shadow war between israel and iran inside of syria and russia's play and all that and knowing that there's going to be a war with Hezbollah. It's going to have to happen at some point. What are going to be the considerations? Everyone's annoyed at Netanyahu. You let this happen or we didn't attack then. I, look, I, I don't even think the Trump administration would have been behind Israel if it out of nowhere was just like, hey, we're going to go blow up a bunch of things inside Lebanon. I think we've seen today something that we never would have seen otherwise. And yes, I'm going very glass half full rather than, than empty. We're not as Jews or as a country of Israel, going to get more sympathy than we got after October 7th. The only other thing that gets you sympathy is being annihilated by a nuclear weapon. And at that point, sympathy doesn't make a difference. This is as much as you get. And therefore, now we know that. We know emphatically that's what it is. And we have to act accordingly as Jews. Israel, I believe, will. In the United States, it's my firm belief that as long as DEI uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion is your governing philosophy, and it is implemented inside of foreign policy. Like if you like if you truly believe as a practitioner of national security that the greatest threat to the United States is climate change, you're insane. Like I, you may really want to have a very nice environmental policy. You may want to have renewable this. You may want to do Green New Deal type of things. But you are an insane person if that's what you think the greatest national security threat to the U.S. is. And it's codified and it's put in our own national security strategy document. It's not China. <laughs> it's not Russia. It's not Iran. It's not North Korea. So, it's not nukes. So climate so climate change and transphobia are the greatest threats to uh, to. Uh... One, and you would Foreign think I'm security. joking, and many people would be like, well, that's insane. Read the National Security Strategy document, the first one put out by the Biden administration, whereas the Trump administration took a year and said top tier is China and Russia, second tier, North Korea, Iran. Yes. <laughs> what does it mean for that, the Jews? That's, that's it. So what does it when mean I for the Jews? I see well-respected papers from people who have enormous funding in think tanks, who said to me with a serious face about the Syrian civil war, a lot of this is caused about the, the uh, lack of access to affordable air conditioning in Syria. They're <laughs> aggravated because it's so hot. <coughs> yeah. And as if air conditioning was invented more than a century ago, as if, like, do you listen to yourself speak? So we've created a fantasy for ourselves, which is which is very unfortunate. Another attendant thing that I've always thought is that you don't, your society has to be far along and fairly secure before you tick through all of the actual things. Because when you're, when you're concerned about climate change, but you're standing in a room full of tarantulas, the, the, suddenly you're like, no, 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 tarantulas, that's the problem, right? But when you're sitting there and everything's looking really, really well, and you're like, hey, I don't know, let's go to a coffee so shop. I, I, no, you're, you're absolutely right. I, I have a question. I mean, Seth keeps asking about the Jews, and, and I, I think we'll kind of circle around them. We'll, we'll We'll, we'll nail them eventually, but uh, the question is, Leo. I, I, no, I'm curious, why is it um, that this uh, fantasy world 
uh, foundation for a policy, uh, you see a lot of it on the left. And, and again, I'm not saying it because I'm, you know, I'm necessarily conservative right. or none of those things. I'm just seeing the results of, you know, we live in Israel. This is the results of the Oslo Accord where the left convinced itself and everyone else that you have a partner for peace and we can do peace, even right. though all the signs were against us. Like you, you're in a relationship, the guy's beating you up. Like, no, he's a sweet guy deep inside, yeah. right? right? So. Uh, so here's this is happening on a small scale. Now you're saying in America, the same thing's happening on a lar- on a on a global scale. Wh- what is it? So it's like a two part question. See if you can kind of package both. What is it on the left that that uh, that allows or permits you know uh, you know this kind of thinking that leads to this kind of dangerous policy? One, two. How do you balance that? Because you you need left. You can, you can't not have liberal ideas and forward thinking. Right? Oh, you need that right. that voice as well. Right. Why is it on the left and how do we balance it out? See if you can. Part of the lefty idea and the legacy of colonialism, which again is a word that has a definition and the US was not, but France and Britain and Russia were colonialists, right? Uh, The idea of a nation state is like a a, uh, dirty word in Europe and in the United States on a large portion of the left. The idea of having borders that you enforce is a problem. When you have something that makes a country, when you study like nationalism, you know, uh, it's a shared vision, a shared history, and a shared idea of where you're going and a shared set of values um, that you have. When you import so many people with a different value system, as Europe has done, as uh, God rest his soul, uh, Bernard Lewis used to point out, like Europe is gone. It's been said, he said that like 20 years ago. We can look at Europe and see the same thing here. Um, so you get to a point where the founding ethos in your country, that your country was built on, they no longer hold. There is no center. The the liberals of yesteryears is not what it was before. Like Bill Clinton would be considered a neocon Republican these days if he were actually running with the policies he, he had before. So the center doesn't hold. And you spin off of off your access. And this is in large part where we are because it's another thing that, that's an issue with this is There is no limiting principle. Like when it comes to, well, you just have to flog yourself for the evils of your ancestors. Um, There's nothing that says, and then when you've done that one, (laughs) then you're done, then it's good, then we continue. It's which is which is why you get to a point where the where the answer on the right is so frequently screw you. Apologize? I'm not apologizing. Why would I possibly apologize? If I apologize, you're going to drag me through the mud and even more so. There is no, uh, to use someone else's phrase, come to Jesus moment where you're like, um, I'm so sorry. Like, that was a really poor choice of words. Please, can I still have a career and may you not take it out on me and generations of my own children? Nope. You get canceled. You're done. That's it. The mob has decided. Matt, listen, ma- many things that. in society, many things in societies change. Um, you know, if you look at uh, where the U.S. was in the 50s, maybe you say, you know, it was too far to the right. It should shift to the left a little more. Right. Like things change. And that's just how it is. And that's actually normal and it good it, 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 as things develop. So if there's, you know, two billion Muslims in the world. And that many Jews in the world. Maybe, the, so, so I want to get back to, to like, maybe the world is saying, or or, or the United States is saying, um, or people in the United States are saying, like, we want more Muslim representation here. We want something else from what it's been. Why should the Jews who are nobody on, on the on the quantity scale have influence? Let's change the direction of how you know like the elon omar thing there was another guy from uh, somalia who just won an election in ohio 
and I saw that when he gave his um, speech after he won the election, he didn't speak one word of English. So, yeah. Um, wow. So he spoke in Somali. Yeah. So maybe it's natural what's happening, or I would posit it is natural what's happening, given like the Book of Zohar says that the you know, two thousand years ago it already predicted that the whole world is going to become Muslim. Uh, then there'll be a big war between the Muslim and the Jews. And then, you know, I mean, Muslim and the Christians, you know, it's like a, a lot yeah. written about it. But the question is, where does that leave us? If this is what is actually happening, okay, the border, the southern border is actually opening. It is actually open, right? right? It's very possible that Hezbollah and Hamas and all these guys are, are in our country now, right? It's very possible. If you see the videos of, of the southern border and you see mostly men in their 20s and 30s, coming in and there's millions of people here so it's clear so, somebody is allowing this to happen strongest military in the world could close the border if they wanted to so this is happening where does it leave this small group that somehow manages to survive through everything very good point because you can imagine the uh kinus like usy conclave of all the terrorist group getting together for their yearly like meeting to hang out and like, can you imagine being the terrorist group that was like, no, we didn't, we didn't send anyone across the American border. Like they'd be laughed out of that entire room. Like everyone is so clearly sending terrorists through our, our unguarded borders right now. It would be terrorist malpractice to not send terrorists in here. It's, it's not. I, I like it. Terrorist malpractice. It's a good shirt. Go on. So it's, I think the Muslims know this, and there's obviously a internal debate, a long-standing internal debate, but specifically countries like Qatar that support the Muslim Brotherhood, that support the Council on Arab-Islamic Relations here in the U.S., which is an unindicted co-conspirator from 9-11. This is a specific uh, school of thought. Saudi Arabia has them the Muslim Brotherhood listed as a tourist, uh, terrorist organization. So does the UAE. These are the companies that are, th these are the organizations that are paying. So you really have to look at who is funding the mosques here in the US, here in Europe and elsewhere. And you see that they are far more organized. Yes, Jews always were more organized. We saw the birth of Zionism uh, or the rebirth of Zionism, I suppose I should say, um, as a textbook example of how you organize internationally, how you organize to raise funds to create uh, all the institutions necessary for running a state. We did that way better uh, and with far less resources, entirely dependent on other people's largesse, whereas, you know, whereas in the Middle East, there are countries that are like, again, Qatar, Turkey doesn't have a lot of money, but they support the Muslim Brotherhood. This is a different thing than, say, Saudi Arabia uh, absolutely supported Wahhabism, uh, which will, was the strain that attacked in, on 9-11. And then they understood exporting this so that they don't attack us inside the kingdom is a really bad idea. And we need to embrace uh, a different plan for our future. Other countries with a lot of money, your Qatars have not done that. Okay, They are funding this. And it is going to undermine us. And if our general position um, in either the middle or the left is to be so incredible accommodationist, is uh, that that's not gonna it's not gonna work for a country where are because we? they are fundamentally where are different we, values. Where most. are the Jews? Where do where do we stand in all this? What's 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 the outlook what, what, when you think it through? You know, the outlook I, is. I, I'll, hold on. I'll, I'll I'll quantify the question further. Uh, looking a year into the future, depending on how the election works and how what's the level of global dementia hits, right? You know, give us, you know, Jews in the U.S., Jews in Israel. Give us worst case scenario, best case scenario. Okay, you, you can speak in scenarios, I know, because you just you're full of knowledge, but I'm afraid that we won't be able to, you know, touch everything. So let's get to the heart of things a little bit. Best case scenario, worst case scenario for Jews in the U.S., Jews in in uh, in Israel. Um, look, I'm obviously political, but if you well, you know, say you know, so so what you feel, you know, you it's in your heart. It, 
there needs to be in the way things work. Like you said, there was a, on the left in the 60s and the 50s, there, there were liberals and they were trying to overturn things and change things. OK, now the push is coming further. There's always the inevitable pushback. We need to reach that point where people are like where, where and usually that comes electorally because that's what motivates most people to do things. And that's a two year cycle if you're running for the House because you're perpetually running. You need to understand that your side is going to get shellacked continuously if you continue with this belief system or continue playing to those seats. So there, that awakening is going to have to happen. For Jews, I would simply say Jews need to understand what their history is and to understand who their allies are. Um, and it's not... It's not the people who are calling you oppressors. <laughs> All the you stood by them for me too movement, and they're flushing you down the toilet right now. That's by design. That's not that. That's a feature, okay. not a bug. Okay, that's that's in the U.S. So if they wake up, they they make some 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 hard choices. Maybe change seats. Maybe right. Maybe the right. choose better partners. Okay, what about Israel? Do you think Israel will survive what's happening? Yeah, Israel will definitely survive what's happening. I mean, I think you guys obviously have a lot of uh, issues that you need to work out. I won't get into the whole Supreme Court uh, deal. It's, it's funny to see in the United States, people on the left just come out reflexively against any type of change to the Supreme Court. Yet if you actually ask them, if our American Supreme Court were to operate like this, this, and this, would of you Of course, okay? of course. No, no. They're like, no, what the hell? That's, that's ridiculous, right? Yeah, don't, don't get me um, started. So Israel is, uh, I, the biggest thing that gives me heart is that I look at how, at how Israelis came together after October 7th. And yes, it's spring more, more so now. How so many people thought that you guys are all soft, this new generation of Israelis. You know, you weren't the people who dealt with the 73 war, with the Yom Kippur or Ramadan war. Um, and look at how they perform now, which is which is incredible. When I look at the U.S., for example, uh, or by way of contrast, when I see a new, if I saw a new 9/11 happening, I don't think the United States would get together. I don't think there would be a unity. I don't. Same attack as 9/11. Half the country would I say think, that, that the U.S. deserves it. Yep, half the country would say the U.S. deserves it. The other half would be like, it's your fault. We'd attack each other and it wouldn't be there. And the other people would be saying it's climate justice that was the problem. Israel came together after having unprecedented protests for well over half a year. Um, and it really jolted them back together. Maybe that says something that the United States would too. I, I still don't I still don't see it. Um, but I have more hope for Israel, frankly, than I do for the U.S. at this point until some of these forces are pushed back on. Um, the peace process stuff, yeah, look, that's, in Israel, we've seen recent elections up until more recently, like for the past 10, 15 years, security was not the number one issue. Israel got to a point where, where like the United States, you could deal with third, fourth, fifth tier issues. Um, and make that your number one issue. Well, October so 7th brought it back home. Security is always the number one issue, and you need to have something ready for that. You need to plan for Gaza the day after because Palestinians don't seem really capable of governing themselves. They failed in every opportunity. I'm sorry, not only governing, I, I would imagine that if Palestinians really didn't want Hamas, they would by now use the momentum to overthrow Hamas and take over. They're not doing that. So that kind of proves the point. That's why I'm not even talking about Palestinians. And I'm not even talking about what's happening geopolitically, because as you said, there's so many, um, so many things that need to happen for pe realizations of people that, that need to have in order for things to kind of regain some, some normal balance. Which, which brings the ball back to our court, which is really what, we're, what we do here in this show, uh, Matt. This is really um, where the interesting thing uh, really happens because it's really stacked against us. You know, <laughs> you said a lot, of, a lot of things need to, you know, if this and this and this and this and this and, and you still don't have such a, you know, a great expectation for the U.S., maybe Israel is better. But even in Israel, if this and this, is, there's so many ifs, uh, it's like it's, it's mind boggling, right? So much is hanging on so many things. So 
we're asking and we're asking our guests here you know what what is it um and, and this is i'm not so so much asking the, the political strategist in you i'm asking you a person a jewish guy who's been to israel who felt something here and uh, who you know do you feel like somehow we need to carry ourselves a little differently that we have a slightly different um role to play here in in this game that, that that's proud, really the you know what's that be proud and be strong okay uh, it was ben laden himself who said people see a strong horse and a weak horse and they will always choose the strong horse be the strong horse I know about your beaches. Most Jews know about your beaches. They're fantastic. I would select a Mediterranean beach on the Tayala in Tel Aviv over just about any beach in the entire world. Love it. Love it. But that doesn't need to be your sales pitch. I, I'm I'm done with the selling Israel as the as the like beautiful, lovely every if you don't want to hear that, fine. Here's what they are. You strike them, they kill you. They're strong. They will not put up with your crap, and they're a force for good because they are and will continue to be as they have been, as they were. We are, Jews are a light, especially Israel, like on other nations, okay? So this is the natural role of Israel. If people don't see that or don't want to see that, that's their problem. I like it. Um, question. So... Let's look a day uh, after um, this war ends here, and you know, for the Jews in Israel, okay, that the war ends south, north, maybe both. I don't know. Let's say we we've acquired some level of peace and quiet for a while. For a while. even in the Bible, it's always thirty years, twenty years, right? So it's never eternal. You acquired some, <laughs> yeah. You, you acquired, acquired some. Uh, what what do we do next? Uh, is it Back to business as usual. In in your feeling, in, in your in your heart of hearts, you get what... back to arguing amongst yourselves. You know, <laughs> well, no one can throw a good argument amongst ourselves as good as Jews can. You know, true, true. But but, a, a, but but again, a, is it just about like living the good life? You know, the beaches, as you said, is it back to the beaches and making good, uh, you know, startup nation stuff? Oh, is there something else? Is is there something else that's missing? Well, what's your feeling about of, it? Of religiosity, right? I mean, if you're, uh, I'm okay with Israel being okay. You know, I, it, if you want to do everything as the Torah says, basically, and to be this an even brighter light upon the nations, by all means, have at it. Good. I mean, that's that's what makes us special. It's what makes us different than uh, other religions and other. Well, what makes us special? Uh well, there's uh, that, that. No, no, no. I mean, what were you just talking about? What were you just referring? The very to? end of the show, you bring the. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, a big, a big offensive. <laughs> look, we're the first of the monotheistic religions. We're what everything else is based on. We're the original quality. Everything else has been a facsimile or a kind of copy of it. Has diluted some of it uh, down, but real simple operating guiding principles, ten commandments. Hey, that's us. You know. People looking up, what is the, you know, it's Easter today. And like, what, what is the Easter egg? Like, where does that come from? And I'm like, you know, I don't actually know, but I, I would bet it's taken somewhat from Judaism. So we have an egg on our plate for Passover and it stands for something. Uh, and they look it up and they're like, you know, well, yeah, you're right. It turns out that that's what, right. Where'd the, yeah, bunny, I know. Come, where'd the bunny come from? That's the big that, question. That, that they we'll can't that answer the and episode. I have no idea. Right. Exactly. But that, so that's, you know, that this all this all came from us okay the idea of arguing amongst ourselves where, where arguments are encouraged disagreements and we record them we make a talmud out of it or mishnah it's this is this is ours we're supposed to be thinking we're supposed to be pressing back against one another and we're supposed to learn from it and go forward that's a, a unique thing to us that so, okay so so that. thinking so thinking and pressing up against each other how do we do that in a uh, way that we don't kill each other? This is great. Okay. This is, this is something that's Jewish and it's something that we have and it's something that the world needs. How do we do it? Cause in the U S for example, we press against each other and we just want to kill each other. So how yep. do the Jews do it in a specifically unique way where it just makes them stronger and they don't end up wanting to kill each other? 
Well, Israel already does it. Because if you've ever been to a Kaspomat or ATM machine in Israel, you realize there is no uh, body space at all whatsoever. So we're always pressed up against each other. And this is normal. Uh, it's a societal thing. Um, seriously, though, um, I, look, I, I don't know the... I don't know how to answer that. I think, I think we argue more amongst ourselves. That's just ingrained in us. Uh, you know, when we learn from rabbis that yes, but there was a machloket there. You know, an argument there between two two these different viewpoints. That that's part of our learning process. You know, but but but, but then we all we should we should have this loving embrace at the end. We 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 failed to yeah. do that recently. Right, we're not, we're not doing it's zero. It. It's zero sum, is where we are, at least in in American politics, but also increasingly also in, 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 in Israel. Now, exactly. Yeah. So how how do we change that? Because I feel like without that, we're we're worthless. We're just like everyone else. Yeah. Um, honestly, the fact that there are national security issues that are um, demand great attention in Israel serves as a much larger reminder that like we still are hunted as a people we are prey as far as other people are concerned so we can do all this but at the end of the day we need to have each other's back i may disagree with everything you say in your house but when a gunman's trying to shoot you i'm grabbing my gun from next door and i'm helping you out you know because you know it's you may well, be an uh, idiot, but you're my idiot. You know. Right, and, and what we're saying is, we're saying exactly what you're saying, except we're reversing the order. Right. That, that if we if we have each other's backs before the uh, the gunman comes, the gunman won't even dare come. They won't even dare to come. To Not come. only that, they will want to put down their gun and be like, "Wait, how did he do that?" Because you look, I look at some of the comments. People are like, oh, "No, we we want the you know open the borders and drop the." Other, you know, no identities, no nationalities, no, you know, peace right. and love. But you, you don't know how to do peace and love with egoism. The only one who, who know, who have a memory of how to do it, Jewish people. We know how to argue, fight, like I want to kill you, but then hug at the end. This, this right. hug in, on top, this is what's missing in the world, if you ask me. And if someone... I think can... it's more there in Israel, though, than, than the rest of the world. I mean... Friends who would come visit me while I lived in Israel, they'd see me talking even in broken Hebrew with the taxi driver that we went someplace. And they'd say to me at the end, it looked like you two were going to kill each other. And I'm like, no, that was just a discussion. That's <laughs> literally what it is. And I don't, do not want to sound like Tom Friedman is from where I am. And, you know, everything's about conversation with the taxi driver. But my, my point is, that's how we talk. And it doesn't matter whether he was Sephardi, Mizrahi, Ashkenazi, the driver. That's just that's how it is. And it started from a place of of the hug, so to speak. You know, they just don't see it. For us, it's it's ingrained. Um, it's very important. It's just uh, Matt, I'm going to I put in the chat a quote for you to read for us from Rav Cook. Um, I don't know. I have a feeling maybe you read it before. I don't know. But it's OK. It's a great quote. If you can read it. And then if you had the ear of the Jewish people. Everyone, for 30 seconds, 60 seconds if you need, uh, what would you tell them? So read a quote for us, out loud, obviously, and then tell us what you would, uh, you know, what you would so tell the everyone. Quote is, only when love is exercised in Israel will complete peace and faithful love come, and the pure feeling of recognizing the brotherhood between people will develop. When that development is completed within us, at a degree that merits being a role model to many, all the nations will recognize it, and the blessing of peace will begin to dwell in the world. Yeah, I mean, it's a good, it's a good quote. I, I mean, it's essentially saying, "Be the light onto other nations." Um, I agree. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry that I also work in the, that I, I tend to be more pessimistic generally. Just like I'm, that's how i am um so i think a lot of people are going to a lot of people like the argument side without the hog as you were saying before this thing right here i would tell jews to absolutely to follow this but to be the example that you would want the rest of the world to emulate i would also tell them also have your uh your papers and uh your bar mitzvah uh, 
all that in in order because Israel is our our homeland. It it is, and you we're not wow. guaranteed. Our future isn't guaranteed anywhere outside. How long of do you Israel. think we have? How long? How long do you think we have left in in America? Look, we could have a long period of time. I I, I mean, and the whole tide can turn, so I can't. You know, did did, did you see the uh, the Franklin Franklin Foyer piece of the Atlantic in, in the Atlantic, the end of the Golden Age? Yeah, and people on the right have been saying that too. Uh, um, it is it is true that the Golden Age of Jews is ha certainly looks gone in the past year. I mean, we went like seventy five years or something since from Leo Frank being uh, uh, basically killed for it being thought that he raped someone in 1915. There, there haven't been attacks on Jews the way there is now and the way it is normalized. So the, the difference these days is not, it's the volume and it's the quantity and that it's all happening at the same time. And it's from every part of society. Um, that is a shocking awakening for many. And we'll see what that what that means for us as a people going forward here i would take our prospects in the united states well over any other country anywhere because the stupidity i see in canada is even worse europe gone um so it's literally it's israel and the united states and uh israel and the united states always used to be different than the rest of the of the world and the united states was founded on judeo uh, uh christian principles so we used to share that. We used to see it that way. And we as Americans and Jews used to realize that that was the important link as opposed to just the um, unreligious view of tikkun olam, which is simply social justice, so much so that we isolate ourselves in the process. Uh, you're involved in the uh, in the upcoming elections? Yeah, I'm working with uh, Dahlia, who's running against Ilan Omar. Uh, in so, the Minnesota's fifth congressional district, and some if, if it's possible, t t today's conversation was very, very broad and kind of high level. But well, as we the guest name is Brodsky, come on, I mean, what do you expect? <laughs> uh, you know, I thought my name Brightman. I thought in in English, you know, Brightman. It's like oh, he's very bright, but it comes from Yiddish. It just means broad man. He was like a fat guy. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, well, is it like Schumer, like sales uh, shoe salesman? He always like <laughs> no Sh Schumer means nothing. That's what it means. Okay, okay, right, right. He's like, it means Shomer, and it's like, you don't know Hebrew, moron, right? <laughs> you know, I think he doesn't know German. The Shoresh may be something, but he, vowels do things, right, yeah. So we're um, approaching a, an election in November, right? So yeah. things, we expect that things, something's going to happen, don't know what, but things will be twisted and turned around here. Um I've got a lot more questions. I know Leo does too. Maybe we could uh, circle back in a couple months sure. and see how things are developing. And and what is and and the, the thought really is what is in our hands to do? Like we all have day jobs. Like for you, it's in politics and you know w w all these things. But as Jews, like what is this inner thing that we need to? You know, what is in our hands at the end of the day? You know, we're we so organized as Jews. And I'm seeing a lot more of that. There are like WhatsApp chat groups. Look, most Jews, it's not a shock to you guys to hear that at least 75% of the Jews in the United States are liberal or Democrats. And I see how they've created new groups after October 7th, like on WhatsApp, to talk about all these issues that are facing us. Like for me, I obviously want to be like, look at this <laughs> like don't you see that is the issue? Like, like I just want to say to them they hate you they will always hate you because they believe this stuff like wake up and smell the roses but at the same time they're at least having these discussions now and i think that's that's incredibly important because all of this will be reflected it's the beauty of democracies uh not to wax poetic but there are votes those are moments in time where things are recorded that let you know, well, I guess that's how, how people so think. If this election goes against the Jews, it's also going to be pretty, um, you know, a moment of reckoning, a come to Jesus moment as we right. said earlier. Come well, look, Moses Israel moment. only lasts. Come to Moses moment. <laughs> Israel only lasts if it's not nuked by Iran. So I look at real national security issues and say that there has to be 
a administration that isn't going to be coddling Iran, um, but is instead going to make it quite clear, uh, you know, through whatever means is necessary. We're we're at the end of uh, you're at the end of giving grace periods to the regime in Tehran. They're, they could have a nuclear weapon in seven days. That that's how much they've enriched uranium since uh, 2020. So that's that's not a, a theoretical thing. That's something that's going to have to be dealt with. So the presidential inbox, as we say, uh, is going to be rather packed uh, come next January. Um, yeah, and I think there's going to be. That's where we will see how many people decide not to vote. How many people are voting locally but leaving blank what's at the top of the ballot for president? If people hate Trump, uh, but they realize they can't vote for Biden, um, or if people want to show off people who are very much Democrats and progressive, but they find that Elon Omar is a bridge way they just they, they can't do that. Are they gonna con are they gonna not vote? Or are they gonna show up and vote and just leave that part blank? Or are they gonna show up and actually vote for uh other Republicans, uh, people, are they going to have a, a great rethinking, which I think I think needs to happen. Jews for far too long have always wanted to just assimilate. It has never worked for us. It's wonderful. We've been resting on our laurels here in the U.S. Uh, it, it, I mean, yeah, obviously, look at Germany before the Holocaust. That This is, yeah. we need to understand that we are the others any moment they want us to be. And we actually are the others because we're better. We should know that and rest uh, and, and understand that. Um, but with that comes great danger um, and great responsibility. All right, I, I think um, I think this is this was a good message. Uh, I think it's a it's a time, as you said, for everyone to to rethink and to ask questions. And it would be great to actually uh, check in with you in a few months and see if, uh, based on all the surveys that you guys are running, and all the polls, people are actually asking those questions. Uh, I'm curious. Uh, we may be going to election here in Israel as well. So, but it, that will be the six in two years. So who cares? But um, I, uh, I really want to thank uh, Matt, who managed to really, you know, put so much stuff into our conversation. It's been a while since we had a good. Uh, you know, a good political strategist in our midst. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for uh, coming. Thanks. Thanks for uh, sharing also your heart. Not only your, uh, not only your messaging box. This is good. Um, and uh, we we invite everyone, of course, to like us, uh, comment uh, on the show, uh, subscribe, of course, if you want, and. Uh, We'll be here next uh, Sunday and also there are a couple of great episodes coming out as well. So look out for those and uh, hopefully we'll see Matt soon as well. One more time or on our panel, we'll see. And uh, thank you, Matt. Thank Thanks you so much. Me. It was a pleasure. Keep Love asking you. the big questions, guys. <laughs> we'll see you. We are the True Function.